Welcome back. So now in part 9 we look at the Sunni Shia split. Uh, we are continuing the series on Iran's Poison Arrows, a paper by A.J. Juice. The inventions begin. According to tradition, Al-Mansur commissioned the city in 762 AD and construction was completed in 768 AD. The result was the round city of Baghdad still visible today on satellite imagery and circling around the location of the Kadimia Mosque. And immediately we get the earliest inventions of which we have no extant originals. Mukatil ibn Suleiman was a captive from Balkh and the author of the earliest extant Quran commentary. Ibn Ishaq delivered the earliest biography of Bahavid. Ibn Juraji, Ibn Juraj was the first collector of sayings of Muhammad. The historian al Waqidi, of course, who invented sources and stories such as how the Prophet got married to a rich Quraysh woman. Ab Abu Hanifa was the founder of a law school who just so happened to meet Anan bin David in prison, none less than one of two brothers in the succession to the Exilarch in Pompadita, Baghdad. According to the fable, the latter's brother, Hanaya, Josiah or Hassan, was enthroned in his stead. Anan proclaimed a rival Karite Exilarchy, Karajite, which led to his arrest in 767 AD. The supposedly Muslim legal scholar Abu Hanifa apparently came up with the idea to pronounce a religion that was different from rabbinical Judaism. That is not the interesting part. This is, the majority of his followers were opposed to the rabbis. For now, the story does not check out, but it somehow connects with the ousted Alid Karajites. It feels like the last stand during the power transition by the Alid branch, in particular since Anan appears to have relied on Sadducee sources. Besides, Karaism was nothing new as is maintained. It originates in the split between the schools of Hillel the Elder and Shammai in 30 BC, which is also the demarcation line between the Abbasids and the Alids, the Sunnis and the Shiites. Hence, he is probably not against rabbinical Judaism, but against not being its supreme leader. Likewise, Exilarch Hanaya or Josiah or Hassan was probably not his brother, but his Marzutran relative, as Anan himself would make this distinction. His followers migrated to Jerusalem, where they maintained a synagogue until the Crusades. It spread across Syria and Egypt, as well as Southeast Europe, Sadducee home turf. Anan's group is said to have scooped up the followers of Abu Isa, the Jewish prophet who had opposed the Abbasids and accepted both Muhammad and Jesus as true prophets. So since you, to summarize, he's saying that the Abbasids are essentially the Sunnis and their leads are the Shiites, if I understand AJ Jews correctly. When we look at Anan bin David's story and what follows, we might find a path to a solution. The rifle heir in Pompadita, Baghdad was pushed off his throne. Where did Anan go? Screaming silence. At the same time, the Jewish Umayyad beliefs were blotted out. A 10th century Muslim traveller, Mazudi, compiled a poetic history of the Caliphate, reflecting back on the transition of power from the Umayyads to the Abbasids. It is not contemporary and therefore inadmissible, but nonetheless, it's worth paying attention to it. The women of the house of Umayyad lament, for their daughters are orphaned, their good fortune slept, their stars set, for fortune does sleep and stars do set. Their high men bars are vacant. May peace be upon them until I die. The men bar was, of course, inherited from the synagogues, as was the prayer call. He is saying that the Abbasids not only wiped the Umayyads out, but also their conflicting sectarian beliefs. It would live on in Umayyad Spain for a while. The Abbasids not only oppressed the Umayyads and their beliefs, but also Christianity 
and the remnants of Manichaeism and Zoroastrianism. According to Mazudi, the magnificent fire temple in the royal city of Ishtahir in southern Iran lay in ruins and the sacred fire had been carried away. So here's a, a reference to the prayer call mentioned in the Talmud. So it's Talmud Mas Yoma 20b. There is a, a teaching in accord with Rab, or Rabbi. What does Gabini, the temple crier, call out? Arise, ye priests, for your service, Levites for your platform, Israel for your post. And his voice was audible for three parasangs. The book referred to as Acts of Religion, it's a 10th century compendium of Zoroastrian beliefs and customs during the time. Its view of Judaism is highly and surprisingly inflammatory, as we'll see in a moment. A.J. Juice says, while a religious opponent is perhaps not the most trustworthy source, the Dinkard corroborates Masudi. This work is from the heartland of Iran. It stands out for addressing the issues that Zoroastrianism had with every conceivable religion. It did not mention Islam. What they had to say about Jews was not flattery. Exposition in the good religion regarding the fact that all virtues arise in man through the Mazdi Asian religion and that owing to the evil faith of the Jews, all vices arise in man. Be it known that all good qualities continue to arise in this world from the Mazdi Asnian faith, and all weakness has been known to arise to the devilish faith of the Jews. Thus the world becomes better through the Mazdi Asnians and gets ruined through the Jewish abomination. They're not exactly pulling punches here. Men acquire contentment, diligence, zeal, obedience to God, modesty, dignity, power of cherishing, morality, wisdom, courtesy, magnanimity, charity, truth, faithfulness, good intentions and other good qualities by the divine wisdom of the Mazdiaznian faith. The man possessing this improves the world. Avarice, revengefulness, slothfulness, idleness, pride, obstinacy, insolence, envy, immorality, ignorance, selfishness, disobedience, indifference to religion, miserliness, falsehood, ingratitude, evil intentions and other vices arise through the Jewish abomination, which by its false knowledge and weakness endures the world. Now, you could put that down to just uh, lazy anti-Semitism, or it could be that in the period prior to the writing of this, they've had a bad experience of um, interaction with Jews. I suppose the when we look at the text there, it's so strong on it, it, it would suggest that they're, they've experienced some sort of practical bad experience, maybe because they are the subjects of the society and not the rulers. Um, and so therefore they, they feel badly done by. The deep-seated hatred was perpetuated through organized religion. But in light of what Masudi said, we must pause about cause and effect out of the context coming from Baghdad. Exposition in the good religion about the three calamities that will befall the Mazdi Asnian faith during the millennial period of Zartosh through the three rulers of the false faith and three priests of the same. Be it known that during the millennium period of Zartosht, in the interval between the time of Zartosht and that of uh, Aushavdar, the Mazdi Asnian faith shall be severely shaken by rulers of the false faith. The Turkey prince Arjasp and his followers is to give the first blow. The second calamity will come from the ill-famed prince Alexander Rumi and his followers, and the third from the bareheaded Sa'ad, the Arab leader, and his companions. Likewise shall the faith suffer during this period of Zartosht from three priests of the false faith, of whom the first is of the white race, Mani, the second is Mazdak, who aids evil in the world, and the third is Muhammad. Do you get it? Do you notice that there's no reference to Islam, apart from what might be considered a reference to Islam, Muhammad? But if 
we look at it in in the context of the fact that it it has a very negative opinion of Judaism just a second ago, it would suggest that Muhammad is connected with that. A.J. Juice says that Muhammad made it to be the final enemy of Zoroastrianism as part of the Din Karat's discussion about Jews. No Muslims anywhere. But if the Din Karat connects Mani and Muhammad with Jews, after all, both are Judaic religions, what does that make Mazdak? This is not the paper to take this subject on, but it is an elephant in the room that is not overly difficult to sort out once the genius governmental system is halfway understood. One hint, the formerly Zoroastrian Salman al-Farisi, a.k.a. Jewish exilarch Hanamel, a.k.a. Uthman. The transition to Abbasid rule did not come easy. A passage in the Zukwin Chronicle reveals grave internal conflicts and humanitarian disasters. He, Caliph Mansur's governor, set up a Persian at Marda to bring the fugitives back there and collect the tribute, the poll tax. The population had taken flight from there more than from any other place, and the whole region was occupied by Arabs because the Syrians had fled before them. This man was called Halil ibn Zaydan. He made the Arabs suffer many ills. He had no equal for his hatred of the Arabs, either before or after him. He made the Arabs move from region to region and took all that they had. He filled their lands and their houses with Syrians and made the latter sow their corn. The writer Pseudo Dionysius of Talmar distinguished three parties, the Persians, the Syrians and the Arabs. They hated each other over their ambitions for the top posts. Dionysius made observations which indicate that the changes may have been accelerated by a succession of natural disasters. There was great affliction in the lands of the south because of the drought which we mentioned above. All the southern and eastern region was roused by the cruelty and persecution of Musa ibn Musab. The inhabitants invaded Mesopotamia. In the beginning everyone gave them alms, but when this host of poor people, of these strangers, of these starvelings, increased excessively, one stopped giving, for the inhabitants feared to go in want themselves and to become more miserable than they and moreover, the governor, through fraud and theft, had taken all the wheat from the landowners and had it sold. The inhabitants of the various regions of Mesopotamia joined together and entered the towns, fleeing the famine. All their property was sold, and no one wanted to lend to them. They ate meat and dairy produce throughout Lent. Because of the low price of livestock, they were given as much meat as they wanted everywhere. In certain places, this famine became worse for the native inhabitants because of the multitude of strangers, to the point where they attacked the corpses of the dead. The strangers who had abandoned their land because of the famine, in order not to die there, were preceded, accompanied and pursued by sword and plague, wherever they came and went. When the ills increased because of the governor, death, famine, plague, and the various diseases which swooped down on men. These men abandoned their houses and went to settle in the mountains and valleys. There they died like flies from hunger, plague and cold, and they were eaten by birds and beasts without anyone to bury them. This might remind you of that story that we saw in the last episode, where there are crows feeding next to the supposed Zamzam well. So maybe there's a little bit of um, reference to that in this. This plague weighed heavily on the lower regions and desolated the whole of this region, with the result that courts where they had been 40 or 50 people were left without a single inhabitant. In Mosul, more than a thousand coffins were taken out of the town daily. In the region of Nisibin, several villages which had become sizable were totally ruined. All the great of the region died. Above all, this plague caused the death of the priests of towns and countryside. Fields, villages and the great courts of the towns were left deserted. Natural disasters can trigger rapid social change. Again, this testimony calls into question the dating for the inscription at the Dome of the Rock. But Al-Mansur's brutality appears to have been legendary. The Caliph moved into the western region in order to go to Jerusalem. 
he wreaked havoc, turned everything topsy-turvy, terrorising and devastating, to a degree worse than in Mesopotamia. He acted as Daniel had prophesied of the Antichrist himself. He turned the temple into a mosque, because the little that remained of Solomon's temple became a mosque for the Arabs. He repaired the ruins of Jerusalem. Whatever remains stood on the Temple Mount was converted into a mosque, as though there should not already have stood a mosque for over a century. So why is there a mention of um, the Temple being turned into a mosque? I thought Abdul al-Malik had an inscription there. Do you see the problem? The fact that al-Mansur's son was a Mahdi, Caliph Muhammad al-Mahdi tells us that the entire charade was about nothing other than the Jewish leadership. Sure enough, soon thereafter, a third competing Shia Ishmaelite caliphate arises in the Arab Peninsula. These developments did not go unnoticed in the Far East either. A ten-foot stone was erected by a priest of the Syrian church in 781 AD. It was signed in Syriac, not Arab, with Adam, priest, uh, Corypiscopus, and Papash of Sinistan, some sort of a, of a Pope of China patriarch. At that time, following the text, the church in China was under Nestorian Christianity, hence the Nestorian stele. In the text, a virgin gave birth to the man Jesus, and the Trinity is being divided. They worship towards the east seven times a day, clearly distinct from the five daily prayers in Kufa, hence probably no mosque orientations from the early Umaids and early Chinese mosques, perhaps being Nestorian churches, and use the cross. The tablet claims that their scripture had been brought along by a certain Olopon and translated to Chinese in 635 AD. It conveniently falls into the first year of Umar the Great. The Stella talks about conflicts placed to 713 AD, which parallels the rebellions around the time of Umar II. It presents Syria, unfortunately, with unclear geographical definition as a sort of a heaven of goodness before the power transition to the Abbasids. The fall to the new Jewish regime started in 744 AD. Now, it goes on to say, although the dragon's beard, Persia, was then remote, their bows and swords were still within reach, while the solar horns sent forth their rays and celestial visages seem close at hand. In AD 744, the priest Kiho in the kingdom of Syria, looking towards the star, China, was attracted by its transforming influence and observing the sun came to pay court to the most honourable. That is, the first year of the Umayyad ruler, Marwan II. The Nestorians fled their prosperous land in conjunction with the ultimate downfall of the Umayyad leadership. So there's a connection being suggested there between the Umayyads and the Nestorians. The iconography of the tablet shows a cross, the left image, that looks similar to the medieval coat of arms of the Italian city of Pisa, the right image. A cross with four arms with flared ends and three spheres on every arm, indicating the three aspects of God. While Melkite's Nestorians found a temporary refuge in China, in the mid 9th century, they would be exterminated only to never recover from the terminal blow. The same fate would hound the Zoroastrians and the Manichaeans in China. The only part here where I question A.J. Juice is whether he is reading it correctly about them escaping um, the Abbasis by going there to China, or are they just doing missionary work? Are they just traveling there because that's part of their missionary zeal that's the only bit i would um question in our next episode we're going to be looking at the jewish nazi pleased in our so see you all then for that bye bye